Hi, I'm Donna Wilder. And I'm Janie Donaldson. Welcome to Quilt Central, where we celebrate quilting and everyday living. We're going to decorate our quilter's dream house. So stay tuned. Funding for Quilt Central has been provided by the American Quilter Society, dedicated to promoting today's quilter. Quilting Machines International, providing quilting machines and supplies for the world. Sulky of America, taking creativity to new heights with decorated threads, stabilizers, and books. Bernina of America, nothing sews like a Bernina. Nothing. Lawn Tamers, great landscaping takes more than just trimming the grass. Lawn Tamers Nursery and Garden Center. Fairfield, maker of polyfill fiber fill, pillow, batting, and foam products. Free Spirit Fabrics, quilting fabrics with style. The National Quilting Association, a nonprofit association promoting quilting and quilters. Quilt Central, celebrating quilting in everyday living with your hosts Jane Donaldson and Donna Wilder. The concept for Quilt Central began with an empty house in Paducah, Kentucky. We went room by room using different themes to decorate the house. We started with the living room, which is the central part of any home. Let's take a look at the before. Now you can see what happened when we put our busy hands to work and created all of the quilting projects. You'll notice first the window treatment. We selected a themed fabric that we began with. We then took that fabric and Janie quilted it on the long arm quilting machine to create the slip cover for the couch. The focal point of the room is the beautiful wall hanging that was done with the stack and whack technique and it has the fan pattern. We even added the fireplace cover that features the cue for Quilt Central. So sit back, relax, and enjoy our show. Stack and whack. How many of you know what that means? Well, my guest today is going to tell us how to do that quilting technique. Joining me is Bethany Reynolds, who is with the American Quilter Society. She is also the author of Stack and Wackier Quilts. Welcome, Bethany. Hi, Don. I'm really happy to be here at Quilt Central today. Well, when did you develop this technique? I started playing around with this in about 1993, and it took a couple of years to really work the bugs out and just see what you could do with it and have fun with it. Well, I understand your books are the top sellers, so it must be a technique that everybody <laughs> likes. It is an awfully fun technique, and once people get started with it, it's very habit-forming, <laughs> hard to stop. Well, the quilt that you've done is so spectacular. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's a fan quilt, uh, and fans are wonderful because this particular design works in just about any kind of fabric that you want to use for it. And I've brought a couple other examples with me to show you, uh, besides the one we have here in the living room. Uh, here's a uh, blue and white one, kind of a Delft effect, uh, that uh, shows that even with a very sort of monochromatic fabric, even if there uh -huh. aren't a lot of colors in it, if there's good contrast and interesting shapes in the print, you can get really lovely designs. Uh, and we have another one that's a plate fabric. It's got sort of collectible uh, oriental t sort of mm -hmm. plates. Uh, and that one just made really wonderful designs. And it, it's kind of fun when you can have so many fans and so many different designs to show off all in one quilt. Now, each design looks like it's so perfectly placed. How did you do that? Well, there's, there's a little trick to it, but it's not very tricky. Should we go ahead and, and sure, uh, let's, show how let's we do show that? how we do that. Um, well, let's sh should we show the block for oh, your sure. you want to do this that? Is the, the fan block is made out of six pieces. Mm -hmm. And in order to get this kind of um, kaleidoscope effect, we, right. we need six identical pieces. Okay. But instead of cutting each one individually, we're going to just um, do a little trick here to get, get them all the same from the beginning. Uh, I'm going to take my yardage and split it up the middle for a couple of yards. You need to have at least six repeats of fabric for this okay. because we need the six identical pieces. And what, uh, explain what a repeat is. Well, a repeat, um, when the designer lays out the fabric, um, they can uh, put as many repeats on a screen as will divide up evenly. Mm -hmm. And we can usually see, if we look at a, a motif on the fabric, say this castle here, right. and then we find it again here, that's a design repeat. And it'll just keep repeating at the same interval through okay. the whole fabric. Uh, sometimes I just use one design repeat, which would, mm -hmm. in this case would be about that long. 
for this particular design, if you're doing a quilt, you need so many blocks for a big right. quilt that it really is more efficient to cut a bigger piece to begin with. And I've designed it to use a screen repeat, which is a little bit longer. And we can find that very easily where the selvage is printed right. if we just look for the name and just line up and measure and see how long that comes out to. So that's 23 and a half inches on this fabric. Uh -huh. And that's a pretty typical um, repeat length because of the machinery that's used. Right. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm working with half the width of the fabric, and that's so that I can very easily cut a single layer with my 24-inch ruler and not have to Good idea. be shifting. And I've trimmed off one end straight here. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to measure off and cut a rectangle that is half the width, and it's, it's that magic number long, whatever okay. that repeat length was. So I need 23 and a half. I've just set it down there at 23 and a half. And I'm going to cut there and come down to the other side. And it's a 24-inch ruler, so I can just put my half-inch right. line there on the edge. And then turn the ruler so that I can cut between the two. If I just pull them well, apart a little a good bit way, so, so that it's see. always even yeah. on the ends. Right, so we have a rectangle. Mm -hmm. Now, that's one screen repeat right. long. It happens to be two design repeats mm -hmm. on this fabric. Some fabrics it might be three, um, <laughs> because sometimes you might only have about an eight inch repeat. And some fabrics it might only be one, because sometimes uh, it's the designer large. might have used the whole screen. So your yardage also varies, and that's why in my books I always have charts that work out all the math so that oh, you don't have to do make that. Make it easy for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> because most quilters don't particularly like math. <laughs> um, True. Now what I've done is just laying this on top, and then you just use your fingernails until it just disappears. Mm -hmm. So this is how you get everything to come out even. Yes. All and there is exact, to yeah. Exactly the same. And then once I've got it, I don't have to get this really perfect at this point because we're going to even it up again later Good. on. But this is kind of rough cutting out to get that repeat. Mm -hmm. So you've got two, if this is here, it's the same on the underneath mm -hmm. piece. We've got two identical pieces. And we would need to cut four more of these so that we'd have six. Okay. We need one layer for each piece in the block. Good. So now I know you've done that. So yeah, should I move these? Yes, we did a little bit of work okay, ahead I'll of time to I'm over here. get quicker to show. I press the repeats and I use sizing so that I get them nice and flat mm -hmm. and smooth. And then I take and pin them down through the stack. And I like to take a pin that's got a head on it. I can get a hold of one. <laughs> okay. I'll unpin one here so that I can show you. I find some place on the print where I can see where it repeats. Oh, good. Or see the motif very easily. So I'll take a little right. dot there and just push the fabric up onto the pin at that point, down through the stack. Preparation is extremely important in yeah. this one, I can see. This, this is the, probably the most important step for getting it accurate. Right. Uh, because this is when you line it up through, and very often uh, when you do that, your, your edges might be all mm -hmm. uneven over here, just because we did rough cut it that exactly. first time. But this gets it even again. Um, and would you do that in several places throughout? Yes, yeah, so I do it uh, usually um, three or four places across the width, and okay. then uh, what I do is pin once up on here on each side, okay. and then I keep repinning as I go along. As you move yeah. down. It's okay. easier than trying to pin the whole thing all at once. And now that it's pinned, we're going to trim off and make sure that we have a nice even edge here through all the layers. What do we do without rotary cutters? Now, this technique couldn't have been done until we had rotary cutters because... Because the scissors would never be accurate no, enough to, to do not that. Not to cut that many layers. Okay. And then we'll turn it around. I need to cut an eight and three quarter inch strip for the size fan that I'm using. Alrighty. And so I can do that a couple of different ways. I can use a big square like this and cut my eight and three quarters and then shift it. Mm -hmm. Or I can combine two rulers. If I've got a six inch ruler, oh, I can take what a good and add idea. on. So we have two and three quarters there. So the total is eight and three right. quarters. That's a clever tip. So that gives us our mm -hmm. strip. Now, uh, in the, the Stack and Whack Your book, I have a template for this, but I also have a, a ruler that, that I use because it's a little bit quicker. That makes it easy. And and you, you can use see a paper through it. template, yeah. So that's nice. Yeah, it's especially if you, if you want to get into doing some uh, fussier work with it. Uh, you can see through the ruler to do that. And we'll 
I'll turn it around. And you do turn yours as you go. I do. Um, there are turntables and things when you're working mm -hmm. on smaller pieces, but it's a little it's a piece this big. And okay. you need to have a, a rotary cutter that's nice and sharp. Yes. <laughs> I usually it's easy to uh, to have it snag every once in a while if it's not perfectly sharp. Yeah, and then you just got to put in a new blade. And then you keep really cutting it. Much and once you've cut all of these strips, the next step is to join them together. Mm -hmm. Look at this. See, we've Isn't got that wonderful? Identical pieces. And no matter yeah. where you select it, it always has a pleasing design. Yeah. That one looks great with the castle right there. I'll move these. So we take our six pieces. Mm -hmm. The next step is to sew them in pairs. You'd have three sets three. of two. Mm -hmm. And then I don't press them at that stage because I find it's easier to just go ahead and sew them, the, the three pairs together okay. so that you've got your set of six. Then you want to take and press that. And I press it so the seams are all going from the left to the right on the fan. And you do that consistently throughout the entire piece. Uh, and then we need to put an edge on it. Now, I find that the easiest way to finish these, that what I like for this, I like kind of an, an edge that will show up. So what I've done on this is added a little bias edge. Mm -hmm. And to do that, I've cut a one inch bias strip and pressed it in half. Mm -hmm. And then I just lay that along and just ease it around there, not stretching it or anything. Right. If you have a quarter inch presser foot, it's often easier to use the the left side of the foot. For some reason, Good. it seems to be easier to follow that. Even if it gives you a little less than a quarter inch seam over here, it's easier and it keeps it accurate. So and you sew that on, mm -hmm. and then you uh, place it on the fabric. Well, you need to press it under oh, first. Right. So you take okay. it and just crease it over this way so that you get mm -hmm. a smooth edge there. Lay it on your fabric and pin it on the edges, and then you just stitch in the ditch. And that's your block. And then you sew them all together, mm -hmm. and it's ready to be quilted. And it's just a wonderful, quick, easy project to do. Just well, lovely when it's I am done. glad you explained that to me, and I want to thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks. I'm, I'm happy to have uh, had the opportunity to show this to you. <laughs> and let's go to Jane now, who's going to show us how to do feather stitching on the long arm quilting machine. If you can learn how to do feathered work, it will be a real feather in your cap. Feathers always win shows, and they look good on whimsical, traditional, and contemporary quilts. So I want to give you a few basics today on the techniques of quilting feathers, whether it be a traditional type feather or a freehand feather, and so that you have some idea of how to draw these on their, your own, because you can't always get a stencil that'll fit the area that you need. This is a feathered design, just in case you hadn't seen one. And the center, or where the feathers stem out of, is called the spine. And I'll show you a little bit about drawing that. Wherever you are, you take and you draw your spine on so that you know where your feathers are coming from. Now, a feather does not always have to meet the spine, but it comes close. And then you decide how far out you want your feathers to be away from the spine, and we'll make a nice full feathered design here. And the parameters of how far you want that to come out, those feathers. Now maybe I'll make that a little bit smaller. And I may not have time to quilt the whole thing, but I'll give you an idea. Now a feather actually is half of a heart. That's what a feather is. So if you can cut the feather shape you like and put it against the spine, whichever way you want to put that, and you can use chalk to chalk around it if you're unsure, but after you do enough feathers, you'll actually be able to freehand those with whatever sewing machine you are working with if you are a freehand sewer. So I will show you a little bit about this. I have actually already stitched the spine in in order to save some time and I'll go over here where I'm not interfering with the chalk to give you a little bit better idea of how we do feathered work. Now it is a little bit more difficult than some types of work because in some places you actually have to overlap your quilting so you have to be acquainted with your machine and know where your needle is in order to do that. So I know some girls avoid feather work but it's well worth the effort to learn how. So here we go. I always think round when I 
do these. I think to myself, round, straight. Now these are freehand feathers. They do not meet the spine. That gives you an idea of how you can actually freehand that kind of a loop in there. So I wanted you to see and get the idea of how you can do that around a circle. And I want to give you some ideas of how not only to do this type of a medallion, but also how to actually um, work a border or a corner or something else because there's some real important shapes that you should know. Now one is a candy cane shape. Those are hard stencils to find, but they're very, very helpful. Now, if I draw a candy cane, and that's my spine, I can make one go one way, and I can make another one go another way. You see, and I can create a border just by flipping that candy cane shape. I also could make a corner that actually came out from one of them with the same kind of a candy cane shape, or I could make it so that the corner went in on the candy cane shape. And then I can add my feathers. And if you want to get real fancy with feathers, you'll cut some hearts that have, they go from large to small, and you will actually make that look like it is actually growing or diminishing, and that will give it another really neat look. Another good spine shape to remember is what they call a mustache shape. See if I can draw one right here. It kind of goes up, down, up, down. Now that's called a mustache shape. And if we were to put feathers on that, I kind of round the end and I work my feathers back to the center and I might actually put some sort of a figure eight or a stopping point because I like my feathers to look like they're growing out of somewhere. But you would kind of give yourself a basic line to follow and this is how you create feathered work. Now that's another important shape because you can make that bend into a corner or a triangle. You can close it up or widen it out. And that's another real important spine shape to have. Um, traditional feathers, like the stencil that I first showed you, they usually meet the spine. They come right down to it like this. And you can actually sew over that um, spine as many times as you need to to thicken it up. It will help the look of the of the quilt. And I guess I should probably show you one more thing about feathers. So I'll draw another little spine over here, kind of a straight one. Just a straight line here. And um, there is a feather that has a point on it. They call it a seaweed feather. It actually, you know, points up and down and up and down. And I'll, I want to quilt a little bit, so I'll quickly go from one point here to the next. And I'll show you a few feathers. The spine is the most important thing to do first. That anchors your work. Now a seaweed feather comes to the point and it doesn't necessarily meet the spine and they do not have to be the same height. Kind of looks like a flame. And you can get as twisty and as turny as you like. Now I'm just going to cut over here quick because I'm kind of running short of time and I'm going to sew that mustache shape in there. I follow the spine always to secure the work first. Get the loop on the end. Remember you're using your chalk just as a guide and it'll brush off so if you're not exactly on the line that's okay. But what you really need to do is you need to have your work as smooth as you can get it. And then I'm going to go run over here and try to do a little bit of that candy cane one for you. Just so you can see. Anchor the spine. Now some girls can go both directions after they do this. They can go forward and backward with their feathers. And some girls struggle with it and they have to kind of stop their machine and go the other way. But you will learn on the inside curve there's a few less. On the outside curve a few more. There. That gives you a little idea. I hope you have learned something today. Please try feathers. 
you will really love the look. If you put them with a grid or a straight line, they really stand out. And like I have said, they always are show winners. I'm sure by now you've recognized that the fireplace screen cover features the logo for Quilt Central. And we're going to talk to Jane and see how she did all of that beautiful thread play work on that piece. Hi, Jane. Hi, Donna. Well, this piece, it was, it's our logo, and we wanted it to be very flat uh -huh. because it's a, in a framework. And we also wanted it to look like it was emanating flames from the center because the quilt central is the center of the quilt world. So we put these long flames on here. Uh-huh. Well, I think you achieved it. It looks great. So we'll show you a little bit how we added them. Okay. So you just are doing a... Uh, Kind of a free motion stitch on this. Mm -hmm. It's a flame <coughs> point and it's uh, very colorful and you can add as much as you like. Uh -huh. How do you know when enough is enough? Is there ever that point? Well, we wanted this one to be very flat and if you uh, quilt with less than one inch increments, uh -huh. spaces, it will flatten right out. Oh, good. Well, this really looks great. Now, the machine you're using, is this uh, an industrial machine? Yes, this is. It's considered a semi-industrial uh -huh. machine. And a lot of uh, sit-down quilters use this. Um, it's becoming very popular in the quilt world because um, not every woman wants to have a huge long arm in their sewing room. And this fits the space and it fits Good. the pocketbook. And I always say, no sewing room is complete without some sort of quilter. Well, good. Now, is it my imagination, or did we use a variegated thread on this? No, this is a variegated thread, and let me put that on some light-colored fabric so you can see how that looks. Uh, there's so many things you can do to embellish. Now, the variegated threads are nice, too, because they give you a variety when you have a multicolored piece, too. It's sometimes hard to select what color thread you're going to use, so I think the variegateds work well for that. Yes, and as you sew along and you uh, change your mind, you are still in the same color way because uh -huh. they come maybe in pinks or they come in fall tones. Or Good. Right. So I'll just do a little leaf thing oh, here. Oh, we're going to see like a leaf. Now, is this a cotton thread or is this a rayon thread? This is a rayon, so it has some shine to it. Which is nice. It gives it a lovely luster. Yes. And I'll just make a little five-pointed flower here. Oh, you're so clever. You can make these look so good. Oops. And, uh... And that way you see how all those different colors kind of emanate from the beginning of the center section there. Mm -hmm. That's so great. It's kind of a neat little... Flower and well, I see some lovely pieces behind me, and I know that uh, they use some thread play in them as well. One up high here is a, it's a chicken or a rooster, and it's done in Celtic. It's one line. You can put your needle down and just sew and sew and sew until you filled in the body of the bird, and um, that's kind of a unique piece, I think. Once we got the hang of it, we ran that whole entire piece in about three and a half minutes. Oh my goodness, how about the second one? The um, leaf one is actually one of Cal Kathy Frank's pieces and it's a hand dyed piece and she uses a long leaf on hers. It's called a seaweed leaf and she just does a beautiful job. Well, this one, I see there's a ribbon on it and I'm assuming that's yours and you won this ribbon on that one. Mm -hmm. I entered that in the uh, Machine Quilter Showcase and it took a Teacher's Choice Award. It's not only covered with thread uh, that's done on a sit-down quilter, but it also has a piece of fabric underneath oh. that we cut away the top layer and we could bring that color up through and that's called that's Reverse great. Applique by Machine. Jane, let's put this uh, logo quilt back in and let you do a little more quilting on that one. Sure. You know, I just am amazed at those of you who work the long arm and the quilting machines like this, that you can do it so precisely. It's like patting your head and rubbing your tummy. It's just great that you can do it. Oh, it comes easy after a while, and you really cannot make a mistake when you're freehanding because it's whatever is in your soul comes out. Well, it looks great, and I'm glad we're showing everyone how easy it is to do.
Well, I'm really glad I learned a lot about the machine quilting today. Oh, we always try to have something new and exciting on Quilt Central. Well, I hope you think we do too, and thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next time on Quilt Central. Visit the Quilt Central website at www.quiltcentraltv.com for more information on this program. Funding for Quilt Central has been provided by the American Quilter Society, dedicated to promoting today's quilter. Quilting Machines International, providing quilting machines and supplies for the world. Sulky of America, taking creativity to new heights with decorated threads, stabilizers, and books. Bernina of America, nothing sews like a Bernina, nothing. Lawn Tamers. Great landscaping takes more than just trimming the grass. Lawn Tamers Nursery and Garden Center. Fairfield. Maker of polyfill fiber fill, pillow, batting, and foam products. Free Spirit Fabrics. Quilting fabrics with style. The National Quilting Association. A nonprofit association promoting quilting and quilters.